The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the Rooftop Butterfly Garden. We wanted to do something to help out our little pollinator. I've been a pretty good spot over the years, but that's a grind. The water that was flowing through the creek went from being muddy and opaque to being clear and pure. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. At the new public library in Austin, there are many ways to learn about ecology, sustainability, and wildlife like birds and butterflies. Come on in. One way is to go to the top. Before opening day, oh, yeah. library facilities manager John Gillum discusses some of the building's more unique features. Homage to the grackle. Everybody goes, why is it red? Because it's art. The art may be red. A third of our energy is going to be produced by solar power. But the building is all green. It will be the greenest building that the green city of Austin has yet produced. Right up to the roof. This is the, uh, the rooftop garden, which we also call the butterfly garden. It is a green roof. It, it means a, a roof that's actually landscaped. The library is crowned with an outdoor habitat, landscaped with native plants. We wanted to do something to help out our little pollinator. We'll do anything we can to uh, track them. If we can come up with different plants, we think uh, we'll draw more butterflies, we'll do it. An oasis of native plants can help bees and butterflies, like migrating monarchs, make their way through increasingly urban landscapes. And it also makes for a nice spot to sit and read. This is really uh, the best part of the library as far as a, a natural setting to sit in. It should be a lot of fun. Putting a park on a building also saves space and lowers energy costs when temperatures soar. We don't have a lot of yard here, right? This is a very urban environment where we built. And so we had to get really clever about how we got vegetation and nature into the immediate area as opposed to the concrete around us. This is going to be an area that really absorbs heat rather than reflects it out. So even in the kind of summers that we get here in Austin, this is still going to be a pretty pleasant place to be. So birds, bugs, and bookworms, in an age when news about nature is not always so cheery, look for some good news way up on the top shelf of Austin's Central Library. Oyster season is underway in Lavaca Bay. This is my home port right here, Port Lavaca, Texas. I've been a pretty good spot over the years, but that's a grind. Uh, this is what I do for a long time. That was 30 years yesterday. That's what I've been fishing over here, this bait. We got so much salt in our blood that that's what I love to do. If you love what you do, I mean, you're gonna stay for a long time like me. 30 years. They call them the oysters. What they doing right now is uh, they making sure that they got three inches of oysters. The state law says that it had to be three inches. 
claws, you see, it's a cluster, so what they come up, they don't come fruity like when you put them on your table. Historically, Texas has been one of the top states in oyster production, dating as far back to the late 1800s. Texas reefs held what seemed like an endless supply, but times have changed. Over the years, the daily sack limits have been cut back. It used to be 150 sacks a day. Now Mauricio can keep a fifth of that. Now it's a, they went down from 150 sacks to 90 sacks. And then from 90 sacks, they went to uh, 50 sacks. This year, the limit, state limit is 30 sacks. So every year, we get less and less and less. And the bad part is the fuel, it don't go down. It goes up and up. But like right now, we're probably going to make 20 sacks all day long, maybe. Recent science has indicated that really most oyster reefs are operating right on the, the border of sustainability. Everybody realizes that something needs to be done. This part of Galveston Bay is getting some much needed TLC in the form of a new reef bottom. The key to restoring the habitat is putting fresh culch out there. Culch could be any materials that oysters can grow on. This reef's getting 7,000 tons of crushed limestone. Looks good. It's really amazing how you're able to operate this giant piece of machinery on a barge. Yeah. This is really important because the oyster reefs are in pretty bad shape. They've been suffering from a number of stressors, including drought and hurricanes. And on top of that, there's a lot of heavy fishing pressure being put on. Pretty sad state of affairs for the oyster reefs currently. So these materials provide a nice clean, what we call a substrate for oyster larvae to attach to and grow into spat, which are baby oysters. The site will be closed to commercial harvest for two years, allowing the baby oysters time to grow to adulthood. By the fall, there should be millions of baby oysters growing on this rock out here. Galveston Bay is not alone. Many Texas bays are temporarily closed to oystering as the reefs recover. You the captain today? To protect the bays yeah, as see. they rest, game wardens are on the water. This area is open to oystering but nearby San Antonio Bay is closed and off limits. Today what we did, we tried a different technique we haven't tried yet. We actually stuck a boat in the water that was an undercover so vessel, and he actually drove out into San Antonio Bay, hid up in the brush for a little bit. TX4051. And he drove down that line and basically wrote down the TX numbers of every boat that was located in the San Antonio Bay system side. They were too close to land and they were in closed water, and they don't have any tags. Y'all were in closed waters this morning. Me? Yeah. No. Yes. It's not all the oyster industry that's actually doing this. There's a there's a few bad apples. He observed you in closed water. No? Yes. No. No. You're gonna have to dump the oysters too. If we let them do what they want, then they would take too much of the resource and there wouldn't be any of the resource left. Okay, one ticket for oyster in closed waters. Okay. Contact Judge Hunt. You have your license on you? If they over-harvest an area, it does them no good the next year and the year after that and the year after that. Short-term gain, long-term loss is what we're looking at. It's gonna be nothing. How the bait is gonna come back? If you kill the chicken, you ain't gonna have egg. We need those oysters in restricted areas for them to spawn and get oysters everywhere. It's bottom line. You kill the chicken, you ain't gonna get no egg. To protect the reefs, at times, there's more bays closed to oystering than those that are open, which adds to the grind. You know, you leave a, one area, a small area, open, everybody gonna put pressure on the area because it's the only thing is open. And this is what happened right now. When you overfeed the resources, they just gonna disappear. A lot of small ones. This one should be ready within four weeks. They're gonna reach three inches. They have to go back to the water. This bay for right now should be being closed for two months. 
they keep it wide open, and there's nothing out there anymore, you know? By the time they close it, it's gonna be too late. It's hopefully not too late. A historic restoration plan is in place. All bays in Texas will now get some much needed help. As a new law requires oyster dealers to either pay a per sack restoration fee or recycle their old shell. Supplier Curtis Miller opts to use his own shell. I felt that would be the quickest way to, you know, see some results. This was a way to see the quickest turnaround right here at home. This reef recovery plan now guarantees new culch will be placed in depleted Texas bays. This shell is on its way back to Lavaca Bay. We're going to put it out there in this area. It's not really a viable working area now, but we're hoping since it's a hard bottom, the shell will create a new reef that we can work, you know, in a couple years. But this is going to happen all up and down the coast in every major oyster producing bay. This is just the very beginning of something that will be an ongoing effort and should make a, a really big difference in the ecology of the bays. If everybody up and down the coast starts doing this, which I believe you're gonna start seeing, that'll make more reefs in Galveston Bay, more reefs in Matagorda area, more reefs in Rockport area, more reefs in, in our area, and the, the boats will be able to stay home. We need to change the habit. We had to change the way we think for those bays to give them a chance to come back. We had to do all those things, you know. For resources to be there, yes, you gotta take responsibility, that's all. And for Mauricio, a restored Lavaca Bay can't come soon enough. His haul today barely covered the costs for his crew. Well, we managed to make a day. At least we're here, you know, nobody got hurt. We were shooting for 20. As you can see, we didn't have 20. We had 17. But the boat didn't break. We're happy. We're ready to go home now. But you can bet he'll be back here tomorrow. I enjoy it. Every single day that I'm out there, I'm enjoy it. I'm happy. And that's the spirit of the fisherman. It doesn't matter how broke you are. If you love it, what you're doing, you're going to keep it doing it. And that's me. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. Take a walk around Nelson Roach's place in the woods of Northeast Texas and you'll see a lot more than just pine trees. Bigfoot! <laughs> My name is Nelson Roach and we're standing on Couch Mountain at Couch Mountain Ranch. Nelson bought the Iron Ore Mountain about 11 years ago. Since then, he's grown the size of the ranch close to 8,000 acres. You feel like you're just a kid in a candy store, you know. That's how you are when you come out here. You always have something that's flowering, something that's edible, something that's creating shelter. That's what's so cool about this place, is it offers so many different things. Before this area was burned, you could not see beyond the tree line right here. And now if you look, you can see all of this underbrush has been burned away and we have new growth that's been regenerated. That's part of what we're doing to try to, try to restore this habitat. Nelson uses prescribed fire to maintain a natural balance between the forests, creeks, and wildlife. There were very few wild turkeys in this area. You would see one turkey at a time, and you would see them very seldomly. However, after three years of controlled burns, we were starting to see groups of two and four turkeys. Nelson formed a turkey co-op with his neighbors to create an area of over 10,000 acres of good turkey habitat. And so this year, we released 80 turkeys. But taking care of an 8,000-acre ranch in East Texas has its own special set of challenges. Oh, it's kind of adventurous. It's 
see all that burning, how it's cleared that underbrush out of there. You know, and he cares about all of it. It's not just about white-tailed deer. It's not just about turkey. And there were five red-headed woodpeckers in that tree right there. He cares about the water quality. There you go. Because, you know, he sees that if one thing's wrong, eventually everything gets wrong. Before long, Nelson noticed something was wrong along Prairie Creek. Oh, look at the bridge over here and the flow. God, that's just fantastic. Such an incredible change. This was a mud hole. A few years ago, you would not have heard this whatsoever. I mean, it's great. First time I was here, there were culverts. They were all backed up, creek was stagnant. Many of the creeks through here were placed on watches through um, Texas Department of Health. Prairie Creek flows into Big Cypress Creek, which flows into Lake of the Pines, which is a major water source for Northeast Texas. And so the idea was that if we could improve the flow of Prairie Creek and improve the water quality of Prairie Creek, that the water that drained into Lake of the Pines would be that much purer what Nelson did was, yeah, he took out those old culverts, but then instead of replacing them with culverts, he puts in major expansion bridges. So now the creek can flow freely and during high water, things can pass through. Immediately after the project was finished, you could see that the water that was flowing through the creek went from being muddy and opaque to being clear and pure. The impact he's making is far beyond his property boundary. It's a positive impact of the watershed as a whole. We're grocery shopping right now. <laughs> Putting groceries on the table. <laughs> when you think about, yeah, this is great. The creeks are clear. We think about fish. But we forget that that water is also what's supplying what you and I drink. If landowners can do the right thing, it eventually makes a difference to the consumer. Apart from his habitat work, Nelson also opens up Couch Mountain to the scouts and the schools in the area. It's special, and Nelson shares that. He's gone ahead and made provisions so that it's gonna stay together, it's not gonna be chopped up into little pieces. Beyond that, it's gonna be cared for in the way he's caring for it now. So it's gonna remain wild. Tyler State Park is, is single track through the woods. Uh, there are no Jeep roads. Everybody ready? It's 10 miles of trails here, so when you're back on the trail system in Tyler State Park, you're away from everything. It's just you and the woods. I come to Tyler State Park and ride about four days a week. I do, I love it. And mountain biking, to me, is kind of addictive. If I don't get to mountain bike at least once a week, uh, I, kinda, I kinda get depressed. And I love Tyler State Park. I love to be uh, on a trail that challenges me. There's something here for everybody. We have difficult climbs and fast descents. I think there's some challenging corners, but there's also stuff for people at every different level. There's some flatter areas that are better for beginners. And there are things that uh, challenge people that still ride here every week. The key thing for riding the trails at Tyler State Park is to stay focused on looking ahead. You'll take in the roots, the rocks. It'll guide you over and through everything that you do. They say it's one of the best trails in Texas, actually. It has a lot of uh, sharp ups and downs, 
quick what we call punchy climbs. And you can work really hard to go up and down those short punchy climbs. There's nothing like coming out here, hitting the trails, hitting them hard, cruising through the woods, trees flying by. It's just you and nature, you get real in touch with yourself. Next thing you know, an hour's gone by and you've had a blast. circle around here a few times to get elevation to get above the trees. Basically a tornado of flying bats. So spectacular. I mean, I've been watching it for 11 years and I still don't get tired of it. It's just amazing. For people who've never seen it before, it's fun to watch their faces and see how amazed they are. I can't compare it to anything else. It's just pretty cool. I'm Nisa Brown and I am the park superintendent here at Old Tunnel State Park. It was part of a railroad that was put in in uh, 1913. The uh, people in Fredericksburg were trying to get to San Antonio quicker and they had a railroad that went from San Antonio over to Kerrville. And that rail line wouldn't lay tracks over this hill because they said it was too big for them to pull freight cars and passenger cars. And so people in Fredericksburg decided to start their own railroad. And they decided to tunnel through the hill. They started in March of 1913 and they were done by July of 1913. And they dug it out by hand. And the first train ran through August 1913 and it was in operation until 1941. And then it was bankrupt, so they decommissioned it. In the 50s, a rancher that lived down the road saw smoke coming from this direction and he thought something had caught fire over here, came to investigate, and it was the bats. So they've been here since the early 50s, for sure. Uh, here at Old Tunnel, we have the Mexican freetails, which our population is at its peak right now, about 3 million bats. And we also have about 3,000 cave myotis bats. They can maneuver through trees and bushes pretty easily. You can see their wingspan is quite a bit longer on the free tail. Free tails are migratory bats. So they migrate here for the summer and then they stay through the fall until about the end of October. And then they'll head back down to Mexico where they can still find food through the winter. Over 21,000 people come just during bat season to see the bats. And that's not counting all the people that come during the day just to hike the trail and maybe look at the tunnel. There's a lot of people interested in the history too. Good show. It's a beautiful night for bats. We have two viewing areas. Our upper viewing area is open every night of the week and it's always free. And it's usually a good view from up there when the bats are coming out earlier. And this lower viewing area is only open on Thursday through Sunday nights for a $5 per person fee. It's a good view from down here most of the season. Most of the bats here in the United States are eating insects, so uh, very beneficial to agriculture. There are bats that eat mosquitoes, so that's a good bat to have around. These bats are active all year round. People are more educated now than they have been in the past. I don't find as many people that are afraid of bats as I used to, so I think that that perception is changing a bit. The more people are understanding how important bats are to the environment, so they want to help them rather than be afraid of them.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and